Alright guys and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be counting down the top 10 spells and abilities added in the Burning Crusade. There were a number of abilities added in the Burn Crusade that I felt added more depth and fun to each and every class. Some definitely got more love than others, particularly rogues and warlocks with a range of new interesting abilities for each spec. As we count down those abilities, I have tried to include every single class, but the simple fact is that some classes got fairly boring spells and some classes got very fun spells, and I prefer to talk about the more fun spells in this video. Just before jumping guys, please give me a quick follow on Twitch if you want to catch any of my live streams. Anyway, let's jump in. So the first spell I have on this list, or ability, whatever you want to call them, is Warrior's Spell Reflect. So this is one of the biggest trolling payback spells ever in the game. It was ridiculously strong in PvP scenarios and also PvE scenarios. There's something very satisfying about using an enemy's spells against them. Like you could reflect Cyclone, you could reflect Fear or anything like that. You could also use it to counter and cheese certain boss mechanics because you just totally reflected the spell. And sometimes with very perfect timing and sometimes honestly a little bit of luck, you can definitely change the fight into your favour as a warrior. It was one of those abilities that had an extremely high skill ceiling and a, basically a really fast reaction time requirement in order for you to pull it off to really make it very very overpowered in any arena environment. The second ability that we have is one of my personal favourites and that is Avenger's Shield. So this is a protection paladin spell, a great opening AoE threat spell that was just absolutely essential for pulling just any trash pack in any dungeon or raid basically. Back in those days they did actually have a cast time of about 1.5 seconds and it would affect the first three targets, do massive AoE holy damage. It has a very satisfying visual spell effect that makes you real feel like you've just thrown your shield around like a boomerang. It also dazed the target, which kind of meant it functioned like a slow effect in a way, although this had it has its uses, but honestly it was more irritating than being useful because it meant that it would take longer for mobs to kind of come to your location if you're trying to wall hug around the corner because there's like irritating caster mobs which is a lot of in the burning crusade then it will just take ages for the mobs to actually come to your location and that can be a bit risky because sometimes there's fairly new players who are dpsing and they will like do dps too early and take aggro from the tank and that can be a bit of an issue. For our third ability, we have a Shadow Step, which was an absolute godsend ability because it no longer meant that as a rogue you had to slowly creep around up to your enemies and risk being detected because of your restrictive movement speed before you can actually deal with your opener. Because a lot of the time, you're going to mess up your opener just simply by the fact that an enemy kind of turns a corner too sharply and ends up detecting you before you can pull off your opener. What Shadow Step did is it automatically teleported you behind your enemy. You didn't even have to like face the enemy in the right location, it just automatically got behind them, which meant you could start to use your abilities which would have to have that requirement of being behind the enemy. It also increased your movement speed by 70% for 3 seconds, just in case the stun resisted or you're trying to go for a different opener without a stun, and you know they tried to run away, which meant you can definitely gain that extra footing on the enemy if they did decide to run away. It also increased the damage of the next ability by 20%, which Overall, just made the typical rogue opener even more lethal because you can conjunct that with ambush. So, like extra 20% damage on ambush, which is only buffed massively by talents, meant you could do some very lethal ambush damage. For our fourth spell, we have the Seed of Corruption. Basically, you're implanting an infectious explosive parasite under your enemy's skin that would explode if enough damage is dealt to the target. Because you're when you're in a dungeon or a raid group, damage will be dealt so quickly that Seed of Corruption would basically explode almost instantly like the second you cast it onto the enemy, which meant the AoE DPS potential of a Warlock was just insane. The second I see a Warlock, in my dungeon group, I instantly put a Blessing of Salvation on him to reduce his threat because I know that the Warlock is going to be really, really good at stealing my threat. Warriors have a much harder time for Protection Paladins with a Warlock in the group because they can't buff him with a Salvation buff. I remember a while ago, uh, me and my friend were talking to a bartender in my local pub in Windermere and he played World of Warcraft as well and was telling us stories of all the confrontations he used to get into with Protection Warriors. He played a Warlock for the, the protection, war protection Warriors simply not able to hold the threat in certain fights when he was spamming Seed of Corruption. Next we have Dragon's Breath which is a very cheeky AoE crowd control effect with very unique functionality because in order to maximise the area effect of the spell you would actually have to rotate your camera to spread the breath to multiple enemies. 
The effect would disorientate enemies, but damage would cancel the effect, so it's largely used to peel melee DPS off your healer, because you can very easily, if you spread it correctly, affect two melee DPS, which is like obviously going to massively help out your healer to just peel that little bit of distance off from the melee from the healers to get him into, you know, it could be a druid for instance, he could get around the pillar very quickly in cat form and cast some sneaky heals. It's very, very useful for just protecting your healer. Or just simply useful in a 1v1 situation or any situation really to just get melee DPS off you to set up your damage or to set up your crowd control. And obviously in the same perspective it has a lot of use in a PvE situation as well to protect your healer if he's randomly got aggro you need to protect him. Next we have Bloodlust or Heroism which has become a very iconic ability in World of Warcraft. In fact it is a core part of raid strategy even today in Mythic Raiding. But back in the Burning Crusade the ability was largely the same but worked, I, in my opinion, I think it worked much better because it was less overpowered because it only affected a single party rather than the entire raid, so it wasn't just like, like more of this mindless uh, raid buffing ability. This meant that shamans, shamans were in high demand for raid groups and there was just a little bit of extra strategy involved with your party setup because ideally you did want two shamans, one to buff the melee DPS, one to buff the caster DPS, or if you only had two shamans, you probably were more likely to use both the shamans in the ranged caster DPS group because it benefited caster DPS is more because obviously it would decrease the amount of time required to cast spells which meant a massive massive um, increase in DPS. Next we have Shadow Fury. These days this is another iconic Warlock spell especially if you think back to the old Cobrack videos from Mr. Pandari to do Destruction Warlock PvP videos and all that kind of thing where he would like mass stun enemies in order to gain a little bit of distance. Very similar situation to Dragon Breath really but I'd say that Shadow Fury, because it's like a ranged area effect effect, it's probably much easier to pull it off than Dragon's Breath. Now back in the Burning Crusade, this spell was actually the last talent in the Destruction Tree and was used in conjunction after a good long casted DPS spell, chained into multiple instant cast spells to basically execute your enemies. You would like cast like Soul Fire straight into a conflagration, straight into whatever instant cast abilities you would have, and then straight into a Shadow Fury just to execute them off and keep them in that location and keep them pinned down so you can pull off all of your DPS abilities. Next we have Vampiric Touch, one of my favourite abilities in the game while I'm playing a Shadow Priest but also while I'm not playing a Shadow Priest and while I'm playing any mana class in the Burden Crusade because this ability turned priests into a mana battery and that's the nickname that priests got in the Burning Crusade. And I don't know if this effect continued um, after Burning Crusade, because I only played Shadow Priest and Burning Crusade. But anyway, a portion of all the shadow damage they would deal would be turned into mana and given to the whole party. So personally, as I'm playing Protection Paladin at the moment, this is really useful because it helps me generate threat and keep myself alive, because it's really easy to run out of mana as a Protection Paladin. Um, unless you're using Seal of Wisdom, but obviously if you use Seal of Wisdom, you're reducing the amount of damage you deal, which reduces the amount of mana and the amount of threat that you can deal. And obviously that means it's very difficult to kind of like hold aggro, but when there's a sh Shadow Priest in the group, I don't really need to focus too much on Seal of Wisdom, which means I can do more damage with Seal of Righteousness and Judgment and all that kind of thing. You know, for healers, it's obviously very useful to have Shadow Priest in those longer fights where it can become, you know, very difficult to maintain your mana because you can get very mana starved. It's the reason why Shadow Priests are so loved in dungeons and raid groups. For our second to last ability, we have another warrior ability, which is called Intervene. To be honest, the main reason why I like this ability is just because it's fun. You know, it helps a warrior to get out around, whether it's avoiding deadly boss mechanics or running back to the boss after a white faster, you can just intervene a player who's like sprinted ahead of something or a mage that's blinked so you can catch up with him. Very easy and very fun to do. But pro warriors massively use in intervene to their advantage, i.e. not me. You can use intervene with perfect timing to protect their, you know, your healer from long crowd control effects. For instance, imagine a healer is about to be cycloned or polymorphed. The warrior could intervene and absorb the polymorph instead, and then the healer could just dispel the polymorph. And then obviously the fight continues and you're reducing the risk of, well you're just re reducing the amount of time that your healer is not healing. So you're increasing the healing on yourself and just making the whole situation a much safer situation by protecting your healer. It's one of, again, it's one of those abilities that warriors have that has a really high skill ceiling because it requires absolute perfect timing to pull off. But um, yeah, it's quite nice. For our last ability, we have Aspect of the Viper, which is a hunter ability. So one of the main irritating things about playing a hunter during Classic and the Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King is that they have mana. 
okay? Which never really made that much sense, like why would you need mana to shoot a bow? But anyway, Aspect of the Viper was the first fix they implemented to make this mana issue less irritating. Luckily, the mana regeneration from Aspect of the Viper was actually pretty overpowered. It regenerated mana equal to 55% of your total link select, plus another 35% of your total level every 5 seconds. This meant Funters had a lot of fight, raid fight endurance and sustainability. Mana issues weren't really a thing. If you weren't like hardcore raider, you could cheese it without getting mana potions and stuff like that, and you could just cheese it with this ability, really, because it was so ridiculously overpowered. Obviously, you did sacrifice your DPS, like, marginally. Well, not marginally, probably quite a bit, to use Aspect of the Vi Viper over Aspect of Hope, but nonetheless, it, it basically prevented you from not being able to use your abilities, which is one of the most irritating things about playing Hunter, is just having no mana and not being able to use any of your abilities, which doesn't make a lot of sense, because you're just there shooting a bow. But anyway guys, that's where I'm going to end the video there. My name is Metagoblin, to the next video, ciao.